you ready to continue our conversation? I'm ready to go. I want to come back for a moment to this um, talk you gave at Notre Dame uh, in July of 1992, um, a roast of James Hillman, where, as you mentioned in the first half of our conversation, um, somebody stopped the taping and um, and um, and your beautiful and gentle way of telling your truth about it was expunged uh, from the proceedings. Um, and uh, you said in the first half of our conversation that you wished you hadn't done it, which mm -hmm. I honor. Because up until then, you, after your separation, you had continued, uh, you and, and Jim Hillman had agreed to continue a working relationship mm -hmm. between. And so this ended that working relationship. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, did you ever reconcile or talk again? Oh, yeah, uh, but not serious talk. Uh-huh. Um, and with this, I, I called him, I wrote him, I did, you know, to ask him what I had done or what, what was it that he, you know, he felt so insulted by. And uh, I never got an answer. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think it was just the personal, the personal as such. And when I say I wish I hadn't done it, um, I, I do tend, in my maturity, to believe that um, people should have a say in what's said about them mm -hmm. by somebody who knows them intimately. And that... Um, I don't know, maybe I should have run the whole thing by him, or... I shouldn't, I, I should have known him well enough to know that that would have hurt him, although I still don't think I know him well enough to know that that would have hurt him, but it did. Mm. Because it did, I wish I didn't, hadn't done it. Mm -hmm. So, one of the principal precepts of Jung's work and that of many spiritual traditions is that consciousness is only gained through suffering. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you, through the suffering that followed this break in real communication with Hillman, was there something that emerged out of it that was of value for you? Well, you know, it was, it was two things, as most things are, mm -hmm. contradictory. Uh, on the one hand, it was a ter terrific uh, high for me. It was a release. It's like I was telling my truth. I was standing up. I was saying, this is the world according to Pat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was liberating. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it was liberating from, from my own energy and my own being. Mm -hmm. um, and the other side was that I felt terrible. Mm -hmm. So, both. So, yes, there was a good side to it. It did give me my own strength. And there's a there's a, a, a suffering that goes with it. Mm -hmm. But in addition to the fact that you stood up for yourself in the moment, and um, was there anything else that came of a kind of a deep separation uh, beyond the end of the marriage that ended up being of value to you? Did you grow? in a direction that you might not otherwise have grown. Oh, that's why, that's why I left the marriage, yes, that I did grow, and, and I had to grow. I needed to grow. I see now. I had to grow in many directions. Mm -hmm. That I, that I, it's as, it's as though I was in a gilded cage. Mm -hmm. I was protected. I was special. I was, nobody questioned my point of view. I taught archetypal psychology. I didn't hear about other psychologies because our psychology was the best. And I was around people who thought that. Which is not really good for, it wasn't good for me. So there was something about, just crucially important for me, I see in retrospect, 
about getting out of the protection of archetypal psychology and being with being in other kinds of psychologies. Um, I studied uh, well, all sorts of things, couples counseling, um, group stuff, um, a little bit. Um, did th There was a thing in Boston going on called Opening the Heart Workshops, which was a wild, this is like California to me, but for Boston it was wild. <laughs> it was almost anybody being able to sign up for a workshop where you go away to a retreat center in Western Mass and you go through exercises where people cry and vomit and confront each other and is contained by um, the leaders were a group of musicians who walked around and they would sort of come over to one group or another or somebody would hold somebody or another person would need to go away and stand against the wall for a while or what was so amazing about those workshop shops was that it undid everything I had ever been told or taught about psychotherapy which was that you had to be careful that you couldn't risk psychosis I mean, in, in Zurich, the word borderline, this is before borderline as a diagnosis, borderline meant borderline psychotic. And if there was any hint in a dream, people said they could tell this from dreams, I, I think I would say you need more than a dream for that, but um, you shouldn't touch the person. You're, you shouldn't take them into deep work. You shouldn't, which means like dream work. So there are all kinds of protections built around a specter of too much so that, uh, so that we're protecting people. What I suddenly learned going through those um, heart workshops, opening the heart workshops, was that it was amazing what the human psyche can do in terms of knitting itself back together. I mean, it can be opened up. Now, there was containment. There was, there was hugging. There was this group going around singing, sitting in small groups, being surrounded by, by song or touching. Those things held people together. Now, that was an amazing learning for me. It was more organic. It was more real people. It, was, it wasn't protected with theory. It was... And yet I saw it. I saw it. I know it. I learned something in an animal way. So that was one thing <laughs> I learned from leaving. I also learned that other kinds of psychotherapy was also full of wisdom. And that there were a lot of things had to do with the psychotherapist, where they were coming from, who they were, how, what they'd been through, their ability to cope and handle, and it wasn't only theory, even though, of course, archetypal psychology is the best theory, or depth psychology is the best theory. No, a lot, it has to do with other more human, <clears throat> more human things that aren't, it's not first of all theory. I mean, theory is important, but that's not what makes lots of situations work. It's people. And people knowing how to work with themselves. That was huge, eye-opening for me. Another thing, I, mean, I can go on for a while about this. <laughs> I uh, was walking down the street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I lived on Harvard Street, five blocks from Harvard. I was walking down the street. I saw there was a bar, and there was a little sandwich board outside the bar saying, Slam Poetry Competition Tonight. And I thought... Poetry. Well, I, I write poetry, you know, let me go to this thing. So uh, I went, we went into this basement place, and I saw things that absolutely blew my mind. This is before slam poetry. This is, this is like the first year of slam poetry before this word even existed. People who, I mean, black people, white people, purple people, getting up, people from the street, people, you know, sophisticated people, sophisticated poetry, getting up and doing their thing that they put together and called a poem in order to 
say something, communicate something, show something of themselves. I was so moved. I, I, uh, I uh, uh, you know, I went back immediately you know, the next night, and then I began going all the time. I met one woman. I don't know if you've ever heard of Patricia Smith. She was a, uh, she was a journalist at the Boston Globe. She finally got fired from making up stories. <laughs> but she was a wonderful, out of the projects type, uh, uh, Chicago, um, natural woman with words and uh, gestures and ability. And she became my hero for being able to be stand up and be true, be be authentic. So I did my first little poem uh, uh, about my mother <laughs> and death. <laughs> and uh, I was so scared that I couldn't hold my, you know, I could hardly hold my thing in front of me, the words. I could hardly see the words. So I memorized it, <laughs> went back. So I began to memorize all the poems be before I did them. And what it did for me uh, was... It, 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 phenomenal here, healing that I hadn't had in how many years of analysis? You know, I've been in analysis since I was 18. And now I was 40-something. And um, and then this Patricia woman I, I just worshipped. I thought if I could ever be as real as this woman is real, and I never can be. I never will be. I mean, first of all, I'm not black. I'm not from Chicago. I'm not. I mean, she had all this suffering and all this stuff behind her. Her father was shot dead because he was, I mean, you know. We all told a lot of our stories, so there was a lot of healing through that. But stories in a way that other people heard, and it healed them because we've all got the same stuff. We've all got the same stuff in different, you know, details are different, but we all are human beings and we all know situations and feelings and the, the reality of those things. So I was on the, I got on the Boston Slam team, <laughs> representative in the nation for the next three years, and we were first and second in the nation. So this is the very beginning. And then I, then I kind of grew out of it. I realized this is a very limited form. <laughs> It's done what it was supposed to do for me, which was get me, get me out there, among the common, among every kind of person, and learn to look at people in a whole other way in terms of their kind of integrity, their kind of realness. So, okay, that was the next three years. Now, none of this would have none of this would have happened so far if I'd still been. The, I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been out there. I couldn't, couldn't be. And then the next thing was motorcycle riding. And that's where you, that's where you had an accident? Yeah. And then so I, tell us about that. I, um, by now I'm in my 50s. And uh, what got me into it, I forget, but I took motorcycle riding lessons and bought a motorcycle, and then started, uh, really got into it, enjoyed so much. Uh, I had one, after the first learner bikes, I had one of these uh, big haunt, red Honda ST1100 that you like a long distance. So I've gone back and forth across the country three times, and north to south the other way once sometimes riding with different guys that I rode with all the time on, on weekends. I trained at the racetrack in um, <laughs> Loudoun Racetrack in New Hampshire. Uh, not to be a racer, although that's for the racers to train too, but just to learn the, the art and skill of this thing, which is a, phys it's a physical thing. What I loved about it was physical. It was feeling the shape of the ground and how you moved your body with the shape of the ground, um, the different smells as you went through different parts of the country, the different kinds of traffic, which is a different dance. It's like a different animal movement in different parts of the country. I mean, California is crazy. 
Oh, I'm in the motorcycle riding here. Will you share a lane with somebody? I mean, I did that here. Uh, these guys are really, really skillful, and stuff happens. I mean, whereas other parts of the country are very, very different psychologies. Um, I loved it, loved it, loved it, and learned in ways that I can't even explain what the learning was. It was physical. Yeah. And, and you know those suits, I've just seen them now in California, I haven't seen them for years, where you zip yourself into this, this suit. I had a red one, I had a black one. <laughs> and you, can, you put a heater on in the winter, or if you're going through the mountains and it's cold, you can plug in, plug into your bike, and you're warm inside. If you're going through the desert here through California, you strip all that stuff off and then put ice in your pockets and open all the vents and you are cooled going through. So I also wore those suits because nobody could tell that I was a woman. So it was a protection. So when I, I did gas and all that, I didn't even take my helmet off. Okay, so I did some years of that and loved it. Loved, loved what I learned. Loved what I learned bodily, physically, about the shape of things. Then I had an accident in North Carolina. I was riding with uh, some guys, friends of mine, and uh, it was a dog. It caused the accident. I'd had a dream, by the way, <laughs> for any of you union minded people. I'd had a dream some months before with a dog standing up and pushing its paws against, against my handlebars. It's like it was time to stop, as a, in retrospect, I say. I mean, things know. You know, there are angels who come around who tell you things. Who, but I wasn't listening. With a dog, if a dog comes after you on a motorcycle, the trick is to, do any of you ride? I have, <laughs> long time ago. The rest of you are smart and I guess. <laughs> Thing to do is you slow down so that the dog, dog will match its rhythm to you. And then, so you slow way down, the dog is catching up with you, matching your rhythm, and then you, then you hit the throttle and suddenly go very fast and it throws the dog all off. So you avoid the dog that way. What happened to me was I was riding second. So the guy in front of me, that he did that with the dog. The dog came. Uh, so he did that trick, and the dog turned around, and there was me. So there was no way for me to do that. The dog was coming straight at me. And so I thought, I, I'm just going to go straight. Maybe he won't turn in front of the tire. If he does, maybe I'll go over the top of him. I, anyway, I just kept steady. I didn't know what else to do. And um, I woke up on the road. Mm -hmm. um, on my back, everything had gone blank until then. And at that point, I realized, I'm telling you this whole story. I hope you <laughs> okay. um, I realized I had to get off the road because somebody was going to run over me, maybe. So uh, I, I couldn't move, but I just I could push my legs so that it pushed me off over the side of the road and just lay there then waiting for somebody to find me. What happened to the guy in front of you? Did he? Uh, he didn't notice that I wasn't behind oh. him anymore. He just went on back to the, the cabin we were staying in. Mm. Um, so I lay there and lay there and lay there and lay there, and then finally some of the guys who had been riding behind us caught up and came over. And they also, so they told me, they you know felt my legs and everything, and everything was still attached, and you know there wasn't my, nothing was severed. The astonishing thing was they said there were people lined up on both sides of the road, sitting there, you know, in their cars. Nobody came over to say a word to me. Oh. I thought, oh my God. Oh my God, people are afraid. When people see an accident, it's like they're afraid. Mm -hmm. 
and and it doesn't occur to them that that it would really be helpful <laughs> if they came over and said, you know, I know you feel bad, or you know, just know that we're here with you, or something astonishing that not a single person would do that. Anyway. So the ambulance came, took me to the hospital. Every little bump on the animal, uh, on the, you know, every the bump on the road, I thought I was going to die getting to the hospital, going up. You know, hospital floors have this, so you go over a bump every time you go through into the next room. So what I found out was I had 10 bones broken and a punctured lung. Uh, so every, each of those little bumps was bumping things apart. And uh, put me in a hospital. And I think the part of the reason I'm going into all of this is is because of the the death and dying motif, you know, that, mm -hmm. that is so strong here at Commonweal. Um, how important it is for people to understand what it's like to be a wounded person. Uh, I mean, even the way they build a hospital. Do you remember <laughs> that hurts <laughs> when you bump, you know, over a, a away through a doorway or onto an elevator. Um, or that people need, people need something, someone to say something to them. So, in the hospital, so, um, uh, nurses came to slide me up in the bed and everything on this side was broken. Mm. Nurse grabbed hold of me here and somebody on the other side and lifted me up and I screamed and yelled, and I could not have said more terrible words or made more noise. And they just kept pulling harder um, and lifted me up. And then I was just sobbing, and I said, everything on that side is broken. Nobody apologized to me. Nobody did. You know. They put a sign later. The next, they put a sign behind the bed saying, don't lift from this side. <laughs> anyway, so... The hospital was a horrible event until the night nurse came on. A night nurse was named Mary, and she came in, you know, she, she just straightened up the bed. I mean, she just pulled the sheets a little bit this way and a little bit this way, went around the bed, caring for the person in the bed you know, caring for the situation. The difference that made was huge. So we, she and I, began to talk then every night. She'd tell me what to watch out for. Make sure on your chart, they said they check this and this. Make sure that this was not on your chart. She was my, she became my advocate. You know, in a place where I had no advocacy at all. So that, that, that went on for a week. Uh, and then a, a friend flew down from Boston and, and took me home. The pain was uh, so great I wanted to die. I mean, they, wouldn't, they couldn't give me any more morphine, they said. I think they could have. <laughs> but um, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite an experience, but I think the most important part of the experience is just that realizing what... When you're the wounded, everybody has to get has to get into the psyche of the wounded person. It's just so crucial. Whether we're dealing psychologically with people, physically with people, um, it's just the key. And the instinctual thing is to separate, at least in our society now. What year was that? Must have been about 1997, right. six. And how did the experience change you? I knew pain. I knew wanting to die. Um, I knew <coughs> th this revelation of the importance of kindness. Mm -hmm. That, that was big. How small, something so small can be so significant mm -hmm. as just straightening the sheet. 
asked did it change me it made me it made me realize I was vulnerable and that motorcycle riding was probably not a great idea mm. although I had to get back on it again and ride for a, a while longer just to show that mm. I wasn't afraid of it mm. but it, the, it had lost its joy mm. you were still living in Massachusetts I was living in Massachusetts mm. yeah no. so and by the way, the separation and the marriage was your decision, is that yeah. right? How did yeah. uh, Jim respond to your decision to separate? Oh, it was, des no, it was terrible. It was terrible. Mm. We were both, it was terrible for both of us. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. Had it been coming for a long time? Um, for the last couple of years, since mm -hmm. we had moved from Dallas. Yeah, mm -hmm. I knew that that I needed I needed to do more with myself, mm -hmm. and I couldn't. And he couldn't. And he actually was a, a very nice man to be married to. I mean, people who know him do not know this. Mm -hmm. uh, that he, uh, on an intimate level of um, with a woman, he's a very very nice man. Mm -hmm. Um, but he could he but he's living with him is also like living with a tiger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's a very big man he's a very noisy man he's a very full of energy man mm -hmm. <laughs> there's things going on all, all the time mm -hmm. uh, and it takes up the whole household mm -hmm. and that's just a fact of who he was born to be mm -hmm. and you have to you have to be able to live with that mm -hmm. So, I think you told me before, and you mentioned it now, that, that when you left the marriage, you really wanted to get away from ideas in the theoretical dimension. And that's the period of time when you just were allergic to ideas and just wanted to be in the real world, is that? I had, um, I had just finished a dissertation mm -hmm. on, um, in Dallas. It was on um, the oh, just a minute the psychopoetics and psychopathology oh the psychopoetics of Jung's early psychiatric writing. Mm -hmm. So it was all those looking at all those early essays of Jung's um, and at his trying to be a scientist using scientific language, using medical language, but coming to conclusions that were actually done in some other way. That's what I was trying to show. Mm -hmm. That it was done through a kind of, what I was calling a poetic, a kind of making. And of course his incredible intuition that was part of that making. So I studied all those cases mm -hmm. in detail. Mm -hmm. And called it a psychopoetics, which is a word that had been used by David Miller once in a actually a lecture out in L.A. So psycho, psychological poetics mean making. Um, so anyway, I'd done this huge dissertation, and I was, by the end of it, I was sick. I felt this is all words. This is all tricks. Mm. This is all, um, I don't want to live from here anymore. So that's what moved you into the slam poetry and then the motorcycle, that these were expressions of being in the world in a completely different way. In a sort of radical, right. <laughs> radical acting out kind of way, yeah. <laughs> so um, then in, you, you separated in what year? 88. 88. Yeah. So four years later you give this talk and then the, the, at the roast and then... So here's a question for you. Very often when a woman is married to a famous man and they separate, there is um, an experience of a loss of status, for mm. want of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, Sacrifice. Uh, what was your experience of... And you'd been in this gilded cage. Everybody listened to you. You were... You know, taught what you wanted. You were you were revered. Um, what was it like 
Did you anticipate the change that you went through, and what was the change like? Um, did I anticipate the change that I No, the, the change of status. The yeah. change of status, um, um, somewhat. I mean, I was willing, I was willing for that. Um, did you but, know that was going to happen? Sure. Well, m maybe not to the extent. Yes, I think I did. I think yeah. I did. What, what was the biggest surprise was that people who were friends of both of us, everybody says mm -hmm. this, you know, after a divorce, it's like people divide up. Yeah. And um, how many people didn't, it didn't stand up for me? So he got the town, as we say. Uh, yeah, he got the town, and mm. where it really showed up was at the very end with, um, when he died, uh, the, uh, you know, the various things that were written in newspapers and magazines and all over the place, I was left out. Huh. It was as though he had had two wives, he'd had the one that bore his children, and then the, the one that it was with him when he died, mm -hmm. and mm. I wasn't there. Mm. So it was the most amazing thing. And some of my friends and people who knew our world and knew me and knew all, knew that I'd been part of archetypal psychology. And For 20 years. Yeah. And I think, I don't know what happened. I again. Yeah, I sponged it again. And I just thought, well, okay, that's part of what I need to go through. Mm -hmm. Although, it just seemed strange. But then you ended up a very senior figure in the Jungian training community. and so I was on. that all the time. I was that all the way through the, uh, the so marriage. So even with the loss of status and so on, it didn't affect that? Did, no, no, because that was a whole separate it was a whole separate thing that I had. How could that be separate? Was it separate because archetypal psychology was a separate world from no. the Jungian training world? It, it's because I was the big deal there, not him. He would come. He would come to meetings. He said it. He once said it was like being the husband of Dolly Parton, <laughs> which seems to be a okay. really weird metaphor. <laughs> but <laughs> when he came to the meetings that I was running, he wasn't this central person. So you and he, were running the Jungian meeting. Yeah, yeah, I was running the Jungian things, and and he wanted to be helping me, but but I, I, you can't. I mean, I had other people. Yeah. That had. So you had this yeah. separate life. I had a separate sense, life. Yeah. In which you were a central person, and um, despite now that's despite the fact that there was a period of time when archetypal psychology was quite at war with the Jungian world. So how, how did you negotiate the, the war between archetypal psychology, which you were literally married to, and the Jungian world where you were important? Because for me, archetypal psychology is a point, points of view and awarenesses that can see through other kinds of psychology. It's not at war with them. Uh -huh. It's 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 an attitude for me. Okay. And that was a big difference. Okay. I mean, for for Jim, it was a set of ideas that were important for me. It was ideas that were useful in terms of seeing through working with all kinds of psychologies. Okay. For me, what I liked was working with people with different theoretical backgrounds, mm -hmm. because. I mean, if there were a group of us, say, interviewing a candidate who was going through the training, we all saw this. We all saw the same things about the person. We saw the problems. We saw the strengths. We saw that we had different language for it, but we all saw, which made me realize these are these are prisms that you know are good for seeing this or that, and we we like our structures and we need our and our structures sort of correspond to our personalities, maybe. But uh, I, it was connecting. For me, it was connecting with the rest of the world and the rest of the psychological world, theoretical psychological world, in ways that were very important. 
So when did you move from Boston up to West Bath, Maine, if I have that right? Uh, yeah, I moved first to Brunswick, Maine. Um, when was that? 2002. Mm -hmm. so just after the towers. Yeah, 2002, mm -hmm. June 1st. And what did the move up to Maine mean for you? Was it just a lifestyle thing or was it a deeper thing? Well, it meant getting close to nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, Maine's beautiful. Nothing compared to California. Mm -hmm. in, in, in its little way. <laughs> and so, and I thought I was retiring. I mean, I had some friends up there and there was a young center up there and um, I thought it would be a nice way to retire. I mean, you know. What happened? I never worked so hard in my life. <laughs> what what unretired you? Uh, what unretired me? Reading, reading, reading. I was near the the Bowdoin College Library. I got into children's literature. Got really interested in that sort of thing. I got, I got interested in nature, and sort of studied some of that too. I uh, gave I uh, taught at the Young Center. Gave lectures there. That wasn't that wasn't so good, but um, somehow I was busy all the time, and I was mm -hmm. still involved with all the. I was still officer of. All, I think I was president of Boston then, so I had to go back and forth to Boston and deal with candidates and had patients and all those stuff. So. From this immersion in the world of Jungian training institutes and so on, and becoming a very senior member of it, um, what, what did you learn from that whole life trajectory, which you still have not completed, but you're nearing? I'm near you know, completion. What, what, if you were to name three things that you learned from uh, an immersion in the world of Jungian training institutes and Jungian professional society, what did you learn? Um, that it's just like any other institution in the world. Mm -hmm. Training is, institutes are institutes. And there's a tendency of institutes to become more and more um, abstract and uh, businesslike mm -hmm. instead of people-centered, looking at things in depth, looking at individuals as individuals, all these things which are Jungian virtues fade away mm -hmm. when it comes to organized training. Mm -hmm. Then there's lots of stuff that's done. So going back well. to John Goldthorpe's question, which I thought was so useful, I wanted to just get a sense of the trajectory the inner and outer trajectory as a human being. When you look back at the question uh, that John so beautifully posed of what you contributed to the evolution of archetypal psychology, is there some way of talking about what you, you know, you're not a person that promotes yourself, but in all humility, is there some way of talking about what you may have contributed to the evolution of the field? Well, the thing that people mostly used to say, I don't know if they do anymore, um, mm -hmm. but was the dream, um, taking, looking at the dream as dream image and talking about the steps of interpretation. Okay. In the dream. Um, after the Terry lectures, we went to the Terry lectures in, what was it, 71, 72? Jim gave the Terry lectures at Yale. He was invited back um, the next year to teach, and I was with him all this time. And they had too many people for the class, this class on dreams, so they needed another section and there was nobody else who could teach archetypal psychology. Mm -hmm. So I suddenly went from a graduate of Ohio State <laughs> in English <laughs> to, uh, to teaching kids almost my own age um, at Yale. Uh, 
And what was that like? <laughs> yeah, well, that, was, that, was, that was tough. Mm. I thought, my gosh, what am I doing here? So I immediately got sick and went to bed. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> I missed the whole week. Of... So, so uh, once I got myself together, I got a, a, a uh, I, I made a chart. Um, I mean, this, you know, this is the sickness you have to get before you get the thing um, that I could do a, I could do image. And here's what sticking to the image looks like when you're looking at a dream. This is the first. And then you might move to a next level where you're uh, imagining some causality with it or you're imagining a narrative with it. And then you may get to the next column where you're amplifying and filling it out. I may have switched those things around. And you're farther from what's actually in the dream. Mm -hmm. So that was a way that people, the students in the class actually had a chart and we could actually work with each, they brought the dreams in, we could work with the dreams using that mm -hmm. methodology. So, I mean, that, I, I got a lot of credit for that. Mm -hmm. And it just came out of, I couldn't do it any other way. I had to make it simple and, mm -hmm. and it worked. I mean, people mm -hmm. could understand that way. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, other thing, I mean... Well, just, let's stay with that one for a moment. Okay. Because there, the principal starting place is staying with the image. Mm -hmm. Now, Raphael. staying with the image is one of the fundaments of archetypal psychology. Rafael Lopez Pedraza. Stick to the image. Okay. So it was Rafael, and then that is something you continued to contribute. But then it shows up in a big way in Hillman's writing. Yeah, and he had said, uh, he said, um, what was it? But didn't he talk about stick to the phenomenon? Yeah, it was something about be true to the phenomenon. Don't true. lose the phenomenon or something so like that. Is, is it, it means no, the same thing. It means the same thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he just had a more sophisticated way of putting it. Uh -huh. Stick to the image is more yeah, Lopez. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that was one contribution. What else? Yeah. Um, then other things are just things I said that other people didn't say. Like I remember in a lecture, some paper in there somewhere, which it had been a lecture, most of my papers were lectures um, about stopping. It's called stopping as a mode of animation. Mm -hmm. I get feedback from that one, usually from actors. Um, that people in the arts, under, for some reason, understand what I meant there. Um, it has to do with um, the importance of stopping dead still and seeing what gets animated out from that stopped mm -hmm. place. And... Uh, yeah, it's it's abstract to say, but it but it it's helpful. It can be it can be helpful. <laughs> mm. The importance of stopping. Mm. Uh, echo, echo's little body. I can't remember what I did with that, except a lot of echoing of. So, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. E e echo. Uh -huh. See, I can't remember what the points of a lot of these things were. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, what else did I well let me go back to something that you said earlier that you really came to understand which is when you did the uh, slam poetry and then you did the uh, in effect encounter type groups um, and became aware of how resilient the human psyche could be and uh, how in uh, Zurich uh, there was such fear of the marginal personality and the, psycho psych the psychotic, psychotic break. Mm -hmm. um, so here I want to go back into Hillman's biography uh, because in Hillman's biography, and, and we, we haven't, let me just sketch this a little bit, but here's a nice Jewish boy from Jersey City, right? His, um, his uh, parents are in the hotel business in Jersey City. His grandparents. Grandparents. His um, his his grandfather 
is actually a very famous Jewish rabbi, right? His yes, mother's father. Excuse me? His, His mother's father, mother's was, father was a father reform rabbi. Who founded uh, Reform Judaism, was it? Mm -hmm. In the United States. Yeah, a very, Florida. very big deal. Yeah. When he died, there was a huge national turnout. His mother then marries this nice guy, but he's not a big deal. And um, in, uh, in the biography, I think Hillman remembers uh, her as feeling that nobody in Jersey City was good enough for her. She was, you know, the daughter of the great rabbi. Yeah. So yeah. she projects onto him the intention that he's going to be a really big deal. Oh, the he's world. the golden boy. He's yeah. the golden boy. Yeah. And so uh, he finds his way through uh, various experiences working in a psychiatric hospital, but he finds his way to Europe right after uh, World War II. And uh, he um, uh, has various adventures, but in Paris, he me meets this beautiful uh, Swedish uh, young woman, mm -hmm. Kate. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's actually on a date with another guy, but with typical right. chutzpah, he walks up to her and asks for a date and uh, gets one. And so they get together and... Um, then they end up going to uh, Srinagar, where uh, he is trying to write the great American novel right. while they're living in a house on the outskirts of Srinagar. Now, this is where I come to the point. While he is in Srinagar, he meets this holy man. And this holy man is an extraordinary uh, guy. And, uh, and Hillman has... Um, a kundalini experience of some kind. And that kundalini experience scares him. And then he and Kate come back, and ultimately various things happen. He goes, does various things. They decide to get married. Mm -hmm. They go to Sweden, where he is going to marry her. She's from a wealthy family, as you said. Mm -hmm. And in Sweden, she's under her mother's thumb, sort of, and he you know, and they're struggling with each other as the marriage day approaches. Mm -hmm. And the day of the marriage, or the days before the marriage, he has a second kundalini experience, mm -hmm. which again scares him to death, and he's barely able to stand up and go through the ceremony while doing this kundalini experience. So after the marriage, I forget, didn't leave in the part where they went to Africa and stuff, but after the marriage, they're on their way to go abroad again, and he stops in Zurich just because of friends there and discovers the Young Institute and decides to enroll in part, as I understand, because he's still scared of these Kundalini experiences. He wants to figure out if there's a way to control them. At least that's the way I read the Is biography. That the way? Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So so the 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 natural reason I brought that up is that uh, Zurich was a place where psychotic experiences were something that people feared, naturally. And uh, I always wondered whether Hillman's response to these two Kundalini experiences was the only response he could have had. It seemed to me that there was a way in which the Kundalini experiences were so frightening and he did not have a frame that enabled him to absorb them in a constructive way. And at least in my mind, there's a linkage between this seeming refusal of the kundalini experiences and the denigration of spirit in Hillman's archetypal psychology. And I'm just, I'm just curious about that. That's obviously a construction of mine, and I'm asking you because you know much better. You know, a lot of those details I don't know from him, mm -hmm. but I but I only know from the book. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. I don't trust Dick as much as I would have mm -hmm. if Jim had told me those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, he wrote a a paper or a book even about Kundalini. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Do I you didn't know. That? That. And I do remember at least one occasion we were in Sweden where a kid called him who was in the middle of a kundalini experience, and he was able to sort of talk him through it. Uh -huh. mm. But now that was years later mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. this period that he must have been 
uh, talking about that. I mean, he was, you know, he was schizoid. I can imagine him. Um, it's just the way Jung also dealt with his terrors. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly been accused of being schizoid or as a defense. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was uh, certainly a, a personality defense, his way of dealing with it. I mean, I can imagine that. I don't know it hands-on. I mean, I'd have to, I have to be with him. I'd have to see what was happening to even have my own take. But my experience of Jung is that Jung's encounter, as described in the Red Book and so forth, and described yeah. uh, about that period, is that he consciously entered into this and he worked did, did. with it and entertained it. Well, Whereas, and you say, we, we have to trust to whatever degree we do, Russell's account, and neither of us was there. But in Russell's account of these two experiences, it seemed that Hillman uh, was um, understandably trying to struggle through this, but not seemingly embrace it. See, I, I don't know. I didn't hear that from him. What I did hear from him mm -hmm. was that he was crazy at his wedding mm -hmm. to Kate. I right. mean, that he, he was in right. an altered state, and he right. showed me pictures of himself where you sort of... Right. Right. <laughs> but, but I took that just to be terror of marrying. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. Scary thing. Yeah, yeah. scary thing. Yeah. <laughs> Been there, Archetypal thing. <laughs> Been there, done that. So... Um, so uh, let me go back to another dimension. You, at least according to Russell, that you, and there's some beautiful passages, um, that you sometimes, you, you talked about, both you and Russell talk about the martial aspect of Hillman's personality. Mm -hmm. he, as that, he did, yeah. And he did, and that you called him the Greek colonel, if, if yeah. that's correct. Yeah. And there's a wonderful passage where you talk about that the two of you would go away to write, but you love to watch him write, yeah. and that he would perch like a hawk yeah. over his writing, yeah. and that he yeah. talked about approaching his writing as if it were a military campaign, yeah. that he had a strategy, that he had tactics, mm -hmm. and then there were, you know, can you say a little more, and, and actually, uh, Russell wonders about where this martial dimension of Hillman came from. Uh, it, it clearly seems to me... Natal. Natal. <laughs> okay. When he was a little boy, he played war games. And uh -huh. he used to tell me that he, you know, he had these complicated things that he would lay out in his mm -hmm. room on the floor mm -hmm. and, and do these, these war things. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's got... Um, I don't know where his Mars is. Mine's on the Ascendant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm pretty martial, too. But uh, wherever he... Oh, he has it on my Venus. Well, I mean, however it works out in his chart. Yes, he's a very martial man. He likes... He's comfortable with an attacking energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, in fact... I think he's so comfortable with it that it's one of his his defenses, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, with an audience, when he didn't know what to do, he'd attack. Mm -hmm. The person with a conversation with it, when he didn't know what to do, he would attack. Because he was so easy with it. It was easy. It was easy to be angry. He wasn't really angry. It was just something he could do easily. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff got hidden. I think it was natal, and I think the things that's strongest in one also turns out to be the shadow, mm -hmm. because it tends to get overused. Mm -hmm. It tends to get used to hide other things. So with somebody like Hillman, I would say what he hides is his softer side and his vulnerability and his um, sensitivity. Hmm. And again, for me... Again, because I wrestle with Hillman. You know, here, here is Son Yashandasani and others talk about him as belonging in the pantheon with, with Freud and Jung. But to me, I think to myself, can I really put him alongside Freud and Jung when his response was that he was a polemicist and that he worked best on the attack? 
in many respects. And to me, those are brilliant qualities. I learn enormously from the writings. But when I'm asking whose psychology I want to use as a map of the human psyche, as I said, first of all, I want somebody who embraces both soul and spirit and the dialogue between them and mm -hmm. character as the mediating force and, and uh, integrity as the guiding, refining point of character, as, as uh, Tarrant talks about it. Um, but I also don't want somebody who basically is attacking and polemicizing against others as a guiding light for me. I can learn enormously from that, enormously from the richness yeah, of it, yeah. but it isn't to me a centered psychology from which to build a life. You know, believe it or not, I think he would agree with you. Uh -huh. I think toward the end of his life, he gave Jung complete honor and said, I mean, I think he feels Jung was a great psychologist in another league from him, uh -huh. and um, that that was okay. I think he recognized it a number of times uh -huh. later on in his well, life, when he wasn't in a youthful, right. I'm doing my, you know, his, right. I mean, he was a he was, poor. Right. <laughs> he was a youth, he was doing a brilliant thing. I think his rhetoric is beautiful. I think his moments of insight that he creates for Are people. Stunning. Yeah, stunning and unique, and, but he's not a young. Right. He doesn't have the the size right. Right. and the um, and yet his of Jung. attack on Young oh, when he was opened young. up a space yeah. where a whole field of Jungian studies became possible because Jungian thought was able to embrace Hillman and able to create space for all those who moved into this new opportunity to go beyond you know, the worshipful dimension of uh, Jung. See, I, I don't think we have to choose. No. Um, I mean, I think Jung was obviously a very big mind, mm -hmm. a very big man, <laughs> very big psychology. Hillman brings his things. Mm -hmm. um, why, why, choose, why, not, why not use them it, it, one, the other, it, use it as a bricoleur, Hillman would say. Why don't you pick a bit of this here and a bit of this here and... You, for certain moments, you know, you don't have to make... Well, I completely agree with that, and, you, and yeah. absolutely. And I think, um, and I, as you said, that was your experience as you moved through life, that you were able, after yeah. the break, to yeah. explore all these other psychologies, the slam poetry, the motorcycle riding, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. period of time when you didn't want to think about ideas at all, mm -hmm. that this was your continuing evolution. Right. Right. You see, to me, right. part of the tragedy of not giving you appropriate yeah, credit know, know. in the evolution of archetypal psychology is that this conversation gives me a sense of uh, a contribution of yours that um, I think is actually deeply critical to a creative reading of archetypal psychology. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think it should have gone my way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I keep bringing him back in my mind. I, was, I want this conversation with him. Mm -hmm. I want this conversation with him. We can sit down and say, Jim, look, here's what I was saying. And I said, Be because when we were together, he understood everything I said or mm -hmm. thought or the reason, mm -hmm. sir. I think what happened, and this is my, just my maybe narcissistic theory, but I think he was devastated when we separated, and he couldn't have anything more to do with me. Mm -hmm. So he made me the enemy. He made me mm -hmm. as though I was no longer psychological, or as though I, you know, I didn't do all the things I did. Mm -hmm. I think he was trying to nullify because he was hurt, mm -hmm. and that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. You spoke uh, in the. Uh I forget where the, it, I think it was in your talk, but of your respect for his first wife, Kate, and yeah. your sadness to this day about uh, how difficult the transition was in your relationship with Jim and uh, so forth. Although it was clear from Russell's biography that his relationship with Kate was uh, very difficult far before you showed up. 
Yeah, I didn't realize all that until I read yeah. the biography. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have any relationship with his, uh, his last wife? Um, a little bit. I mean, we do now a little bit mm -hmm. run into each other, but, mm -hmm. um, and we did when they were dating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, as we enter the last part of this conversation, the last, you know, 45, 50 minutes, what have we not talked about that seems to you, I mean, there are lots of things I want to ask you, but what, from your perspective, as we look at uh, this conversation, have we not touched on that would be useful to include? Um, I guess I just said it, but I, you know, for me it's important that he be recognized for his kind of brilliance, <coughs> that, that, that we're clear that his ability to, to us rhetorically take something apart, create a spark out of that that one's never seen before. Awaken, I mean, a little awakening moment about something is, uh, is his gift and is unique. I don't know anybody else who can do it the way he does it or did it. And not try to make more of it because if you generalize it and you say, oh, he said 100 years of psycho, uh, psychotherapy in the world is getting worse. That's a, oh, what an awareness. Jesus, that's right, isn't it? Woo! Okay, you get that, but to get rid of archetypal, <laughs> get rid of psychotherapy and to go off and do something else at that moment is not the right response because it's not that kind of comment. It doesn't call for that. It's a moment of awakening. And this is the way I see it. It's a moment of awakening. That's the genius. That's what you get. And then you move on to the next moment of awakening. That's what he does. That's his art. That's his gift. He do, you don't make a program out of it. Right. And get rid of psychotherapy and take all the students who are in psychotherapy off into the world and say, that's your psychotherapy now. No. Uh, and that's what happened with it. Mm. I mean, that's, that's what happened with, it, with at least the number of patients that I had. That, um, sort of came from Pacifica and from him, and it was like, whoa, if we're not talking about the world, we're not doing psychotherapy, just a minute, there's lots of different ways to talk about psychotherapy. When you mentioned that he was a bricoleur, which is a great French expression, meaning somebody who kind of pulls things together and makes something uh, out of pieces, and a mm -hmm. great, great expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you read the Wikipedia entries on Hillman, for example, uh, uh, people talk about him as a, a postmodern psychologist, that the age of grand theory is over, that he kind of deconstructed Jung, turned Jung on his head, sort of a deconstruction vision of him. Uh, do you share that view of him as a postmodern psychotherapist, psychologist? I, I'd see myself doing that more. I mean, I, he didn't. He didn't use the word deconstruction. I mean, he wasn't into that. Okay. I got into it at a certain point, mm -hmm. and and that wasn't his language or mm. his thought. And he didn't read deconstruction literature. Um, I think he did some deconstructive things, but that wasn't his rationale. Mm -hmm. I mean, I myself see the deconstructive moves as very helpful methods, but no more than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just that's all it is, just a tool at a certain moment that helps take something apart. Mm -hmm. But you don't try to make a world out of it, or there's no world. I mean... You know, it's so interesting. As I talk with you, I keep coming back to the feeling that this is a love story, you know. I do. Because it's so interesting. You speak of him in the present tense most of the time. Mm. You don't speak of him as if he were dead, which he is physically. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you speak of him in the present tense, and you talk about how you had to get out of this gilded cage 
but it was devastating for him. It was devastating for both of you. But 20 years uh, from the age of, what, 25 to 45, whatever, uh, you were partners in the creation of this. And no one present, no one who listens to this, no one who knows you, uh, thinks that you were anything like a lightweight partner. You were a full right. partner, okay. and right. you are a brilliant woman and a brilliant psychological thinker. Um, and so, um, to me, even if even if there was first the end of the marriage and then your talk, which I think should be a centerpiece for the study of archetypal psychology, the roast, and then <laughs> the, you know, um, to me, it's still a love story. Yeah. It's still a love story, yeah. And, and like many great love stories, there is a point in them in which... Um, in which we are broken open, and we are broken open to our destinies. You know, some fundamental way. Yeah. 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 I've, I mean, there's nothing I can say to that. Mm -hmm. For me, he's alive, he's present. Um, mm -hmm. His gifts are alive, his thinking is alive. And our relationship <laughs> goes on, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I keep trying to tell him what he did wrong, <laughs> how he should be thinking. <laughs> and, I mean, I, it's, it's, as I say, they're ghosts. They're ghosts that I'm still dealing with and talking with him about. If I could redo it, you know, um, I would just make sure that we had those talks. I mean, I would just That's what you make want. them, you know, make people let me in <laughs> to go to Connecticut and say, listen, I'm going to sit here in my house, <laughs> which it was, and, or live next door, and then I'm gonna, we're going to talk every day. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about this. Here's what I did with this. I was talking about it psychologically. You're not seeing the psychology in it. Listen to me. Listen to me. And make him listen. And he would listen to you. He would. If I had hold of him. <laughs> but the and point is that during your 20 years together, he would listen to you. Yeah. Oh, my God, yes, he listened to everything I said. He yeah. understood me. He, I mean, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, in fact, he helped me become verbal. I mean, I was still in a sort of post-traumatic distress Nonverbalness when I met him. So we'd be in classes, we'd be in discussions, and I would, I'd be excited, so I'd say something, and he would immediately hear there was something in what I said. And so he'd stop the class and go into what I said and try to get it so that it's, it was formed, because I wasn't able to form anything at that point. Mm. Um, no, we were, our minds were married. I mean, they, yeah. Let nothing to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. <laughs> yeah. Put something like that. Yeah. But the weakness of human beings is yeah. an impediment, you know, and the... What was his view of, I think I know, but I don't know. In fact, you know, one of my greatest failings has been all the times I think I know what somebody thinks, and it turns out they think something no, completely no. different. <laughs> just get in trouble so much with that. But what, did he have a view of what happened after death? Was death just the end, or was there more happening? That's what I asked him when he was uh -huh. on his deathbed. And, uh, did you see him on his deathbed? Yeah. To I, made, I made it happen. Made, tell us about that. I made it happen. What happened? Oh, God. Not just his answer to that question, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, f first I thought, he should call me. <laughs> he should call me. It's time to talk now. <laughs> I'm ready to talk. Mm -hmm. He didn't call. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm going to go. So I called uh, his wife, and um, 
said when I, I need to come and talk to him, say goodbye to him. And she says, let me ask him. <laughs> and apparently he said that's appropriate. <laughs> So I found what day I should come, and I got up at, you know, four in the morning and got there. Um, and he was into this, so I asked him, so where, what's that, where are you going, what is it? And he says, it's, it's emptiness, it's emptiness, it's all, it's emptiness. And he went into this whole thing about emptiness, which felt to me like a performance. Mm. So... Um, I said, you say it's about emptiness, but you keep talking. <laughs> and then he started shouting at me and said, um, are you telling me I'm doing it wrong? I mean, he, he screamed it so I knew that everybody in the house heard this and came running in a little bit later with pretending she was going to feed him soup. She was furious with me because I had disturbed his peace. Dining. I thought I just called him on his mm -hmm. So um, it sort of went on like that. I asked him if he ever thought about the years of Zurich and Dallas, and he said no. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my God. And so I got up to leave. So you what? I got up to leave. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, he said, why did you stop writing? What I should have said was what, I, what I've been saying here, that I had to do these other things. I had to stop writing, because it was coming out of my head, and I had to get it um, in other ways. I had to get psychic reality in other ways. I had to get it through emotions. I had to get it through body. I had to get it through feeling, you know, on curves and the earth. And there are a lot of ways I had to get it that, that did not have to do with writing. Okay, I wish I'd had been able to say that, but I just dissolved you know, into tears. And uh, then I waved goodbye and he waved goodbye. That was that. Has he shown up in your dreams or otherwise? Oh, sure. <laughs> a lot or a little? Um, oh, um, it, 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 periods, different periods. Um, he's come back recently. <laughs> I mean, for, for a while after he died, he showed up dead. Mm. And I'd keep uh, going to him. And he, um, he was a shade. He wasn't there. You know, he was non-responsive. So I thought, well, these dreams must be about saying, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. Um, recently, as, as my mind has been waking up, and I have been getting excited about intellectual things again, he's, he's with me. He... he uh, um, we're doing a project together, or um, he's he's um, interested in something I'm doing, or he's coming to see. Good, you know, dreams like that. We're 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 connected again. He would absolutely love it here, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. I wasn't aware enough to meet him while he was alive. I, oh. I really regret that. You know. So, what is your own sense about the nature of these encounters with him? Or these? Oh, he's with me. He's always with me. I understand that, but do you experience those as inner uh, inner events in your own psyche, or oh. expressions of the nature of uh, I life? am. That he's alive. He's a, he's, he's he's with you. He's part. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and maybe it's not even. Him, him, but it's the him behind him. Yeah. Mm. Or it's the uh, um, a period in, in uh, Cambridge when I started writing. When I wrote the film paper, 
mm -hmm. um, I gave that to, to you yeah. to look at, was where I was trying to get back into an archetypal psychology conference that he had banned me from. I sent him this paper. But before I started writing the paper, um, a big bird came and flapped at the window. It was the third floor in this house in Cambridge. And it, it shocked me. I mean, it was one of those sides. Well, that's Jim. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, he's a hawk. That's it. Mm -hmm. It was that. It was the energy. Now, it doesn't mean it's him. It means, but it's the energy that was behind him. It was the energy that was with him. It was the energy that was with us. It was that animal, you know. And I've had various other experiences like that, where I look even with your little garden. I look out there, and there's and now he comes in a smaller bird form, but I see this bird doing this crazy little thing or coming toward the, and I think, there he is. <laughs> He's around. Mm -hmm. So it's. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, it's good. It's good. And I think sometimes he likes me and sometimes he doesn't. But um, he's here. And he would adore this part of the world. I wish we'd moved here. Hmm. Well, we welcome him to Commonweal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> welcome. He'll appreciate that. <laughs> Just tell him he's welcome and doesn't have to come with you all the time. He can also come on his own, you know. But watch out for the other yeah. women. <laughs> <laughs> so as you reflect on, I, I don't think either you or I experience our lives as anywhere near over, but rather um, in a particularly, at least for me, a very creative part of my own life. Um, but... Looking back over the journey that you have been on from uh, growing up as a child of a single mother, a Navy nurse, uh, never met your father, or no, his, your father disappeared when you were what, four? Uh, no, before even. Before? No, I'm so when I was a baby. Okay. You were a baby, then your mother marries when you're five, you feel abandoned, uh, you have to be strong, you have to sort of separate yourself from the rest of the family. You're a high achiever in, uh, in, in grade school and high school, bright, the head of, you know, elected the head of the student body, but also have this angry side of you and smoking and hanging out with the bad kids and stuff like that. You go to Ohio State, you're trying to, you know, make, you know, you have no money, you're, you know, working and, and so on. Um, you, uh, uh, you have this experience as a lifeguard that, that one of the children drowns and you take a year off just to recover from it. It's enormously difficult. Um, you hear Jim Hillman's voice, uh, you read some things, and then uh, in an extraordinary thing, I mean, just imagine the courage it takes to go from having no money and, and graduating from Ohio State uh, to fly to Europe and show up at the Young Institute at the age of 23. Uh, the director of studies is coldly tells you that you're crazy and that uh, no way you're going to pull this off, but you don't see a way back. So you, you know, put an ad in the paper, get work as an au pair, live on muesli and water, <laughs> and then meet this crazy... That's terrible. <laughs> you know, this crazy Raphael who's surrounded by mine ads, and uh, <laughs> you're one of the mine ads. Nothing erotic there. No, nothing erotic. No, nothing erotic. <laughs> um, and uh, then slowly you start taking classes with Jim. He actually listens to you, stops a class, stops classes to help you articulate something. You go into therapy with him. Uh, then, uh, you you, then you develop a relationship with him. He's married. There's that whole unbelievably difficult period. Um, and then uh, you're together as he formulates the ideas of archetypal psychology as you and he and Raphael and others together. Raphael plays this key part. 
of developing the concept of polytheism as opposed to monotheism. And so you develop this whole set of concepts. Um, and uh, then, uh, meanwhile, in the midst of this, um, Hillman is being viciously attacked uh, for having an affair with uh, the wife of this American minister who sets out to get him dismissed. And so finally he wins, and the two of you move on, first to the Warburg Institute, then uh, Yale and Dallas. He doesn't win, he loses. No, I mean, the minister wins. Oh, the minister wins. Yeah. Yeah. Hillman loses, uh, but he is freed, he is liberated to yeah. create his own work. Yeah. So then you move on, as we've said, to Yale, to Dallas, mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've talked through the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what strikes me, in addition to the fact that this is a love story and that Hillman is still with you, is that just listening to you is that if I were to say there was a uh, what's the word that carpenters use for the true point? Uh, there's a plumb line. Plumb line. If there's a plumb line in the story to me, in addition to the fact that it's a love story, it is that you have pursued your truth and your way through your life. Mm -hmm. That you obviously could have been sort of enshrined as the um, second wife of the founder of archetypal psychology and although banned from that sort of stayed within that persona but you had this whole other trajectory within the Jungian community where you were acknowledged, respected and, and seen for who you are but you also had um, this deep sense um, of the limitations of theory yeah. And how far more important than theory, not only in the archetypal psychology sense, stick with the image, but in the human sense, stick with the relationship, stick with the actual stuff of life, right. stick with right. uh, slam poetry and a black journalist uh -huh. who is realer than you'll ever be, uh -huh. stick uh -huh. with what motorcycle riding feels like to you, uh -huh. uh, stick with you know animals and the stuff of life, yeah. and that you followed that trajectory right. and follow it still. Right, because that's actually who I am. Yeah. 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 It took me a yeah. while to get that. Pat, how are you sitting with this? It's been a deep, well, yeah. deep exploration. How are you doing with it? I had no idea this was <laughs> all going to happen to me. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm really grateful to all of you. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you all, you all for sure. <laughs> I mean, you for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, you all too made, really made something happen mm -hmm. that was that was new for me, mm -hmm. and learning for me. And thank you, mm -hmm. Pat Berry, um, president of the Interregional <laughs> Society of <laughs> Jungian Analysts. Um, <laughs> and of the New England Society of Jungian Analysts. Um, um, I cannot thank you enough for being with us at the New School. It's very special. We hope you'll be back and that we'll talk about other things and um, that you will become part of our community in West Marin. I hope very much, too. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here.